Um, so I was invited to come out into the middle of the room. I'm not going to do that because it's terrifying looking at you all around me. <laughs> uh, so I'm going to hide over here, as is the want of academics. Uh, so thanks. Uh, thank you for the invitation to come and speak uh, at the Global Ideas Forum. Very excited to be here. This, this talk's going to probably give us a bit of doom and gloom. We'll come on to the, the panel discussion and that'll pick us up again, I hope. Uh, I'm looking to my two panel uh, colleagues. And then when we get into the workshops, really in the workshop is where we'll say, how do we, how do we actually do something about the sorts of issues that we've, I'm just going to speak about now. So I want to sort of position my remarks in the context of human settlements. And the idea that now we live in an urbanised world, there is more, more of us uh, live within urban locations than we do in rural. Uh, and um, a lot of the growth area has to happen, still has to happen in the urban areas and the cities, particularly in low and middle income countries. And so if we think about where we live uh, and where the growth of the the global population has to take place. When I start to speak about what all of this means for health in the face of climate change, there's real opportunities to think about how we design cities, for example. So, my remarks are going to make the point that climate change, environmental degradation, climate change more specifically, will exacerbate the health inequities that already exist. They'll create some new ones, but they're really going to exacerbate what exists. And so I, I just wanted to spend a few minutes talking about what are some of the drivers of health inequities that are separate to climate change, but just some of the societal level drivers uh, of health inequities. And this is a, a slide that I use all the time, really just to make the point that there are big structural factors associated with power, money and resources. So big, big policy issues that shape our daily living conditions. So you might have heard the, the, sort of the language of the conditions in which we are born, we grow, we live, we work, we age. Everything about our everyday life matters for our health whether that's the sort of physical environment that we live in, the sorts of social relationships that we have, the amount of money we have, you know, whether that's afforded through our employment or, or otherwise, all of that matters for our health. I don't have time to go into how that sort of gets in under our skin and gets into our, into our brains, uh, but it affects our physical and our mental well-being. And all of that does not happen equally. If you think about the nature of living conditions for people around the world, it's not the same for everybody. And so it starts to create these health inequities. So in the context of the, the remainder of my remarks, I just want to speak a little bit the about the physical environment, how that relates to social conditions, and then bring in uh, climate change, the natural environment into all of that. So what about our physical environment? So remember, I'm, I'm speaking about human settlements. I'm speaking particularly about the urban environment. And so how we design, how we plan and design our urban, uh, our urban environments matters for health. What you see on the slide is a picture from Rio de Janeiro in Brazil. Uh, on the left hand side of the slide is one of the favelas or the slums, the informal settlements. And on the right hand side is one of the most affluent areas in Rio. So sitting right next to each other, you've got on the left hand side an environment where sort of water and sanitation isn't always guaranteed. You've got very highly densely populated areas. So if you think about a uh, wonderful breeding ground for some of the communicable diseases that uh, we might want to try and get rid of. Uh, sometimes people don't have electricity in those sorts of environments. There are very strong uh, social networks. Social cohesion is actually quite strong, but there are also very high levels uh, of crime and violence. And so the physical, the physical nature of all of that matters for people's health. And sitting across the fence, you see on the, uh, on the balconies of the high rise are the, the little individual swimming pools, affluence, plenty of material resource. 
One of the issues of how that neighbourhood has been designed is not just the issues within the favela on the left hand side, but is this relative inequity across the fence. That matters for your mental well-being. It's not a surprise that people living on the left hand side of that fence are much more likely to have higher levels of mental ill health. That's an urban planning decision. So there are lots of opportunities to think about how we design cities in a way that you don't have those sorts of physical and mental health risks. Oops. This is, I mean, it's old, but this is uh, just really to give you a sense of, uh, so from a kind of a social conditions or an economic conditions, uh, and our working conditions also matter for our physical, uh, sorry, for our, our health. Your material resource is one of the, the key pathways uh, to health and health inequities. And what that slide is showing that for people in the cities, these, these are some of the, the big cities around the world, for people living in the cities such as Nairobi, Jakarta, Mexico, they have to work much, much longer hours just to be able to afford the same thing, the Big Mac, not that I'm recommending that we um, are recommending people eat Big Mac, certainly not. Um, but if you did want to use the Big Mac uh, as an indicator, then you know, why is it that people would have to do that in places Ni like Nairobi compared to Chicago and Tokyo, where it's you know, relatively much more affordable? That's partly uh, the amount of money that people have, so the income coming into your pocket, as well as the price uh, of foods. There, so there, what you've got on that slide in terms of the potential for exacerbation of health inequities uh, is a social policy issue and it's a food policy issue. Yeah, the price of food and the affordability of food. So if we want to think about reducing the health inequities between uh, countries and between cities, for example, around the world. We've got to think about issues of urban planning. We've got to think about issues of social policy. We've got to think about issues, in this example, of food policy. And the inequities in and of themselves matter for health. The more, all I want you to take from that slide is the more unequal a society, and here it's to do with the more unequal in terms of income, but the more unequal a society, the worse societal health and well-being is. So just, just that in and of itself, inequity itself matters and I'll come back to this in a second. So then on top of all of that we get environmental degradation. Yep. So you've got an urbanised world, you've got issues of you know, how we think about planning, issues of employment, issues of uh, income, all drivers of health inequities. And then we've got this added pressure of well, climate change. So this is the, the planetary boundaries framework. I, I don't have time to go into all of it. But basically, the point of what you're looking at there is that already, as humans, we've completely uh, undermined four of those planetary uh, the four of those factors uh, that are important for a stable planet which are important for social development and climate change is one of them so what does that do in the context of those other sort of social inequities that I've already pointed towards that matter for health inequities what does something like this do on top of all of that many pathways to uh, to climate change I won't go through all of them. There's some very direct pathways from climate change through to health. So if you think about uh, some of the uh, things that have been happening very recently uh, around the world. So, and I'll come back to the, some of the concerns around issues of floods, of extreme uh, rainfalls, extreme weather events. So very directly impacting on people's lives and then some of the more indirect pathways where it might affect the social and economic fabric uh, of society and then all of the flow on consequences uh, in a number of ways to both our uh, com communicable uh, disease risk, our mental health risk and some of the other non-communicable diseases which I'll speak, uh, pick up in a second. So I just want to speak particularly about these two uh, kind of pathways related to the urban environment. So 
So yes, we've got existing climate change. How do we adapt to that uh, or not? Uh, and what that means for health inequities. And then, then we've got this ongoing issue of urbanisation and urban sprawl. And we've got this uh, sort of relationship of that contributing to climate change and then the feedback from climate change back into those who are living in those urban areas. So what might some of the issues be? So remember the slide that I showed you of Rio uh, with the favela. Uh, so you've got issues there of water and sanitation of particular types of housing conditions. So when you've got increased temperatures uh, you know, arising uh, with climate change, in housing conditions that are not set up to already deal with heat stress or any kind of uh, yeah, temperature uh, stress, you've got uh, an immediate concern there from a, a health perspective. You've also got the pressures, because of an increasing temperature, uh, you've got the pressures for working conditions. Many people around the world are working in informal conditions, so they don't have any social protection. Uh, and they're often out in areas where you've got this uh, outside with heat stress. And then the water and sanitation uh, issues that I've already spoken about. Some analysis that was done a few years ago, this is, I've just picked the city of, of New York. What, just due to changes in temperature, the projections that are like of, of what's likely to happen is the net it's getting worse basically none of this is a good news story so far uh, it's getting worse so these are temperature related deaths so if you think of already we've got the issues of what's happening in that urban context and then you've got, got the added pressure of increased temperatures sitting on top of these uh, health effects and well deaths in this instance so the next time you go to New York and you love the fact that it's hot and stuffy and you know the humidity that's there, that's because of the urban heat island effect. But actually on top of that, you've also got the pressures due to increased temperatures from climate change. It then starts to take on a, a different uh, meaning. Of course, we see uh, on the left hand side, this was what happened after uh, Harvey uh, in Houston. On the right hand side, that's a, an image from Mumbai. Uh, so thousands and thousands and thousands uh, of people being affected uh, in terms of direct effects from climate related events. Uh, and you, well, you've heard the statistics from that, so we can see that to do with um, floods. There are many of the cities uh, around the Asia region that are at increased risk, and this is a planning issue. So the low elevation zone, that's what that LECZ uh, refers to. So cities, and the big red dots are the cities of over a million people. Uh, the cities have been built on areas of low elevation zone, often because it's cheaper uh, to build in those locations. The fact that it's cheaper to build in those locations means that it's some of the most vulnerable populations that are living there. They're living in houses or buildings that have been built with uh, materials that are not the best materials. And if we're starting to see sea level rise because of climate change, then of course this is where you're going to see the uh, quite profound effects. So that's an, again a planning, a planning issue. So who's affected? by all of this and if you were reading the Guardian this morning uh, then you'll have seen that it's a tale of two uh, populations that are being affected by uh, Hurricane Irma that's coming in across uh, Florida and it's exactly this story. So if you can afford it, if you've got the ability to get out of the way of a hurricane or if you've got the ability to have uh, the housing materials that are able to withstand these sorts of extreme events, you're okay. And of course, that's among the richer populations in society. And as this quote uh, from Kirk Smith uh, said, uh, if you're poor, you're going to die. We saw it happening with Hurricane Katrina. We're seeing it happening with all of the populations that are being affected by the ex extreme events now. And if you read nothing else, I strongly recommend you read Danny Dorling's recent book, book, which is called The Equality Effect. And basically what he argues is the more equal a society, the better able we are to deal 
with these sorts of events, but we're also much less likely to put the sorts of pressures onto the environment that are causing these sorts of events. So addressing the inequities in being able to adapt to the climate pressures that already exist is one thing. Being able to mitigate against the further harm to the environment uh, by addressing the inequities that already exist is another thing. So I hope a key point that I'm trying to make is the inequities within society matter for adaptation and they also matter for mitigation going forward. So a very glib and easy thing to say is, OK, well, how do you deal with all of that? We've got big challenges for global health inequities. We've got big challenges for global environmental degradation, particularly climate change in, in this instance. What do we do about it? There's a whole number of different policy areas that matter. I've touched on just a few of them uh, in, in these remarks. That's very easy. How do you make it happen? And again, uh, just to wrap up, I would say one of the most uh, fundamental issues to getting action. Yeah, so could you might have said to me, well, Sharon, like th th all everything that you've said so far is obvious. Of course, that's what's happening. Of course, those health inequities exist. Of course, it's caused by the way we design cities or the fact that people don't have enough money to be able to respond to or because of the inequities in society. And if you're saying that to me, then the question is, well, why do they continue to exist? Why do we continue to do this if we know the sorts of things that should be done about it? And I would argue it's because we have incredible power imbalances in the system. Who's at the table saying, when we design the, the way our cities are set up, let's not put the poorest people at the low elevation zones because that's where they're going to be the most vulnerable. Let's not do that because we care. They are not the people that are sitting at the table. That's the opportunity, I would say, for all of us in the room is get to that table. And we're going to do that in the workshops, I think, afterwards. But of course, there are the sorts. So this is the, the idea of the nutcracker effect, as my colleague Fran Baum speaks about it, is yes, we need politicians. We need our policies in place. How do you get them? How do you get Richard and Natalie, who came yesterday and who is concerned about these sorts of issues? How do you get somebody like Richard De Natale to say, we want to make sure that every single policy that we come up with does no harm? Who are the winners? Who are the losers uh, in all of this? Let's think about the equity dimensions. Let's not just be talking about climate change policy. Let's be talking about planning policy and that planning policy can be good for health and it can be good for the environment. Oh, and by the way, it can also be good for social equity as well. So that's where some of the community action, the mobilised collective voice becomes really important. If the politicians are not hearing that, if there isn't a collective public good voice at the table saying, you know all of those business interests that are really wanting to keep the status quo that says it makes us a lot of money to build those million, uh, the cities of a million people in the low elevation zones because it means we don't have to spend a lot of money on infrastructure or waste and sanitation. We do very nicely out of this. Thank you very much, Minister. Uh, let's keep it as it is. If there isn't a voice from bottom up saying that's not right, then of course the status quo will continue. So I implore you to get active around all of that. So that would be my take home message, which we'll explore, I think, uh, in the panel. Health inequities is not a biological thing. It's completely socially produced. Climate change will come into the mix and it'll exacerbate it in lots of different ways. And it'll do that through urbanization and a whole load of other ways. Yes, we need multi-sectoral action. That's a very easy thing to say. It's the most difficult thing in the world to make happen. Uh, and the question is, how, how do we make that happen? And we will explore that now and in the workshops as to how, you, how do you get real change to take place. So thank you.